This is the last week in Isaiah. That doesn't mean I'll never preach another sermon Isaiah, on Isaiah while I'm here, but uh, it, it <laughs> and uh, but I want you to pay close attention and see if if what Isaiah prophesies in this passage reminds you of anything in the New Testament. Some of you probably already know the answer, um, but. Uh, and, and then in the coming weeks, um, we're going to do a series called Missional, Church Forward. Um, sometimes pastors are reluctant to do these kinds of things. And here's why. We pastors sometimes get in trouble when we use the Apostle Paul as an example to tell people what the church is. People usually don't have a problem with that. But then, like Paul, sometimes we have to remind one another what the church isn't. And sometimes what comes up is like the cream. It comes up, everybody likes the cream, right? Um, but it reminds us of things that are not necessarily bad. It's just that uh, they sometimes take the place of what is prime in our work as a church, in our life as members of a church. And so... And, so we're going to deal with that um, and joyfully deal with it, by the way, um, over the next few weeks. And then following that, I'll work, I'm working right now on a series called Renovation during the Lenten season. It'll take us through Palm Sunday and Easter and even beyond. Um, a lot of the work of the traditional Lent uh, season, Lenten season is on the renovation of the whole self. And so we'll be working through those things together and learning and growing in God's Word as we work together. I'm looking forward to it, by the way. It gets me going. It's a little... And by the way, I'm, I'm resisting the temptation of, of, of just using a bunch of old sermons that I've used in the past. Somebody, somebody asked me, why do you do that? Why, why, don't, why don't you just... I, I can rely on some of that stuff, some of the research I've done. Um, but I find in my own heart, my, and you would know the difference. I think you would. Um, how many of you like vanilla ice cream? Okay. How many of you, every time you have ice cream, it's got to be vanilla? No. Well, when I just recycle old sermons, um, I feel like I'm just handing you vanilla ice cream all the time. And there's so much more to our faith than vanilla ice cream. Amen. There's so many flavors and sprinkles and all kinds of stuff. There's so much in God's Word, and I cannot, and I will not sell myself or you short on giving you vanilla ice cream every Sunday. Amen. Right. Plus, I, plus, I know what happens to me. It doesn't matter what flavor of ice cream. If I eat it every Sunday morning, I'm going to have trouble. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 60, 1 through 6. <clears throat> Lord, come with your candle. And I don't mean a tiny little candle like we had in here a couple weeks ago. I'm talking huge candle power, radiant brilliance. Uh, the kind of candle power, the, the Shekinah glory of God that we cannot see in these present bodies. If we saw it, we would die. Right? Right? Because these bodies are not made to see that glory. Arise, shine, let your light shine for all to see. For the glory of the Lord rises to shine on you. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth, but the glory of the Lord rises and appears over you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. Look and see, for everyone is coming home. Your sons are coming from distant lands. Your little daughters will be carried home. Your eyes will shine. And your heart will thrill with joy. For merchants from around the world will come to you. They will bring you the wealth of many lands. Vast caravan, caravans of camels will converge on you. The camels of Midian and Ephah. The people of Sheba will bring gold and frankincense and will come worshiping the Lord. Does that sound like anything you might be familiar with? 
Anybody? Go ahead. This is interaction time. Jesus' birth. Luke 2. Anything else in there? What happens uh, after Jesus is born? Um, do you remember? I mean, just look at your, uh, your crèche at home. What is usually on the outside or the surrounding? We have the shepherds, the angels, the wise guys, right? The wise guys. Yeah. Let us adore him. We don't, we don't know much about them. Um, we don't even know if there were three. We just know that three gifts were given. In fact, there is a historical piece that was written not long after Scripture was written that gives the name of 12 royal astrologers. 12 of them. And they must have had cell phones back then. That Some of them got texts while they were on their way to see Jesus. And they had to turn back with emergencies in their own kingdoms. And three of them ended up now that's the that's the that's the tradition. It does not matter how many magi or royal astrologers are there were. It was just the fact that all of them were pagans. None of them knew Jesus. None of them knew much about the Jewish faith. They were from far away. Now where would we find a story like that? Would we find that in Luke? Why, why do we find it in Matthew and not in Luke or Mark or John? Written to the Jews, right? This was a connection to the... And, and it's, it's people who are Jewish, but some of the family members are starting to accept this new way called the way of Jesus. And it's a way to show the connection that this new way is not just for Jews, but for all people. And so those royal astrologers come with their wisdom and their way of seeing. And God uses, it's believed by theologians, God uses their astrology. And they explain something that is not really explainable except apart from a miracle. We know that meteors move. They're broken off from stars and they move. But stars themselves don't move across the sky. Did you know that? I have a little funny thing about stars and us being brilliant and shining like stars. Because if you know your science, you know that some stars shine because they are reflecting the light of another planet, right? Others... Other stars shine because they're full of gas. <laughs> I think believers are like that too. <laughs> sometimes we, sometimes we uh, depend on the light of Christ shining in us. Sometimes we create our own gas, right? And um, God works it through all of that stuff. And in spite of us, God's word is made known through us. So... By the way, I hope that's not the only thing you remember about the message today. Did you know that the pastor said that some of us are so full of gas? <laughs> if we did commercials, it would be brought to you by Taco Bell, right? <laughs> let, me, let me just, this points to, to, to Matthew 2. Let me just read it for a moment. And um, don't, we don't have it on the PowerPoints, and that's kind of intentional. Just close your eyes. I know that's a dangerous thing for a pastor to ask the congregation to close their eyes. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some royal astrologers from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and moved, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. 
And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the royal astrologers, and he learned from them the time when the first star appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem, search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Wink, wink. I'm glad these royal astro astrologers are accused of being wise men. After this interview, the, the royal astrologers, the wise men, went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh is not mentioned in Isaiah. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Amen. This ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Thanks be to God. That is what Isaiah and others, Micah, by the way, is... is uh, is quoted in Bethlehem um, in this tiny little insignificant town. Something great's going to happen there. That's from Micah. So it's not just Isaiah. It's from all different kinds of prophets. And we call this day from Matthew 2 and the light of anyone that's pointing to the light of Christ Epiphany. Now, at the beginning of Advent, uh, we put in an insert in the bulletin and it had the meaning of Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany. And Epiphany was technically on the calendar. It's always January 6th. But we in the West, we always, whatever Sunday's closest is how we, how we celebrate Epiphany. Epiphany is just, it's, a, it's another fancy word for manifestation or when we as Christians and those who are not Christians have an aha moment that Jesus is the light of the world. Right? Some of us were baptized when our parents had aha moments. Some of us can remember our own aha moment. In fact, all of us at some point, even if we were raised in a Christian home, at some point each of us needs to confirm our own aha moment, right? Our faith may be given to us by our family, but we need to accept, with, accept it and run with it on our own. We need to accept that little candle that has all kinds of light, power, radiance, brilliance that we know we can't handle in its fullness on this side of eternity. Today's passage in Isaiah is filled with contrasts in fortunes. Both the wonderful new day of light and glory that is coming. By the way, we celebrate it at this time of the year because um, even in science we know the days are starting, the daylight is starting to get a little bit longer. Never fast enough for most of us, right? <laughs> Remember we talked about this. Who likes to go to work in the dark and, get, and drive home in the dark? None of us. When we get to a Scripture passage like Isaiah, we find that people interpret it in, in very different ways. And today I will share both a little bit of the original context and some practical applications of how we might adjust our course of living according to what we learn from the very real Word of God. So let's look at this passage. First from a prophetic application. To find the context of Isaiah 60, we only have to just go back a few verses into chapter 59 where the Redeemer is coming and putting on the helmet of salvation, His body armor of, of virtue or righteousness, His robe of vengeance, His cloak of divine passion. A Redeemer will come to Jerusalem. Is this, by the way, just the city in Israel today? No. Jerusalem, I, I want to make sure we, when we, um, when our politics are based on uh, theology that 
is not big enough for the world, we can sometimes get in really big trouble. And there's no secret that we're in trouble today, right? It may not be Jerusalem itself. We know it's Gaza. Gaza in Bible times was the, was the land of the Philistines, right? And we know that terrible things are being done in our world today in that part of the world. This Jerusalem, yeah, it may be the city of Jerusalem, but it really includes all the world since Jesus has come and gone to eternity and it will return again. Arise, the, the prophet says, Arise, let your light shine for all to see, for the glory of the Lord rises to shine on you. Who is the you in this verse? To whom is this passage addressed? Yes, it is to Zion, a name and its context for the city of Jerusalem. The prophet Zechariah speaks for God saying something similar in Zechariah 12. This message is from the Lord who stretched out the heavens, laid the foundations of the earth, and formed the human spirit. I will make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink that makes the nearby nations stagger when they send their armies to besiege Jerusalem and Judah. On that day I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock. All the nations will gather against it to try to move it. But they will only hurt themselves. Again, it's not just physical city of Jerusalem that we know today. It's everything that it stands for. And the new Jerusalem is the city of God in eternity, right? Even though uh, today most of the news comes out of Gaza, we know that there has been tension for over 2,000 years over that city of Jerusalem. It's a thorny issue. I don't want to speak to the politics. I just know that God is going to make all things right again. I trust that the prophets of old and the person of Jesus Christ affirms that. The Palestinians, they want Jerusalem. Islam wants it. The Jews obviously see it as their capital, even if most of the rest of the world won't acknowledge it. Nations have fought over it for centuries. Even Jesus said himself in Luke 21, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles until the period of the Gentiles comes to an end. Isaiah could see into the time when this tension was all in the past. So it could be said that he's seeing Jesus coming, but also beyond Jesus coming and beyond what we can see today. Isaiah sees it. He saw the time when it would shine for all the world to see. Why? Because the glory of the Lord would rise upon it. Not the glory of humanity, Amen. the glory of the Lord. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. He will be its light. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth. We feel that, don't we? Again, we're not just talking about the lack of physical light in the long days of darkness. We're talking about spiritual darkness. But the glory of the Lord rises and appears over you. That is, anyone who gathers in the city of God both in time and in eternity. And the conditions leading up to this great new day will be one of darkness. It, and the darkness is described both as physical and spiritual, and maybe other things as well. Again, yes, both the physical and the spiritual over the earth when Jesus returns. Just as the first time Jesus came, there was great spiritual darkness over the earth, we know there is great spiritual darkness over the earth and even in our hearts today. There's not a one of us who doesn't struggle with spiritual darkness. It is a part. And by the way, the moment we accept Christ into our hearts, we are painting a target on ourselves. We don't do this faith alone. We have to do it together. And we need to watch out for each other. We need to create space safe space for each other. As God works His mission in our hearts, God transforms us and renovates our hearts for His glory. 
By the way, the, the Old Testament glory that is spoken of here is Shekinah glory. It's just a Hebrew word that means the source of God. It's not something that we can create. And by the way, humanity can create some pretty powerful light. But not Shekinah glory. How do we know that? Well, we create, we, what we create doesn't kill us, but what God has already created, who God is, would kill us in these bodies. That's why when we read through the pages of the Old Testament, there was so much fear over, I think I saw God and I'm alive. Even the prophet said, I, I saw God and I'm still alive. I'm going to die. Right? Remember Samson's parents when they experienced the vision of God at the calling of their son? Mom and dad got all afraid. We're going to die. We saw God and somehow we lived maybe just long enough to tell, but we're going to die. There was all this fear of dying at seeing and experiencing the glory of God. We know today that we see the glory of God in Jesus Christ who had to, to tone it down a bit. He came to us. He pitched a tent in our campground, right? And he became as we are. I, this is one of those things that, uh, again, I want to ask when I get to eternity, but like I said, my pastor and priest friends tell me there won't be these questions in eternity. Um, how in the world did you fit all of the, the fullness of God into a tiny little Jesus? As a child, I remembered a Warner Brothers, uh, it was Bugs Bunny. And Bruno, does anybody remember Bruno? Bruno, the flying trapeze artist. <laughs> anybody remember that episode? Now, you do? Okay. Um, I remember thinking about this as a child. I wonder if that's how God fit into Jesus. But Bruno and Bugs Bunny have a competition jumping off the trapeze first into these big basins of water and then Bruno at the end jumps into a tiny little glass and of course Warner Brothers does their magic and it, this big muscular flying trapeze artist ends up in this tiny little glass. He, and he can't move. <laughs> I just loved his accent. My name is Bruno. Water is not only for drinking. It's funny what we remember, right? The gospel according to Warner Brothers. Darkness. Darkness is still here. But if we believed even for a moment that it had ultimate power over us, we wouldn't be here this morning, would we? Some of you have stories of your lives where after some healing, you're able to go back to those times of darkness. And to be honest with you, I don't like to separate those of us who worship together between those who have had some really difficult times and those who haven't. We've all had some difficult times at different degrees. And the reason that we're here and the reason that this church is wide open, our heart is wide open to the hurting. Those, those of us, which by the way is all of us, who take the past stuff and bring it into the present, including this guy here, always, always trying to be open. Okay, Spirit of God, what are you trying to tell me today? Um, still challenged, um, still struggling with some stuff from my past, still struggling um, with the ways that sometimes God will allow people to come along that just seem to like to trip those things that I've struggled with in the past, right? And not getting angry, right? Not losing it. We, uh, that's the darkness that, uh, that's still there, right? It's still there. Um, and I wonder sometimes if Isaiah starts with the word arise because how many of us have just laid in bed and maybe not slept too well um, and we re have rehearsed all the darkness as we've laid awake in the middle of the night, right? 
Yeah, that's all of us at some point. And the prophet says, arise, get out of bed. Arise, match the sun that rises. Even before the sun comes up, if you have to arise, arise. Let your light shine for all to see. For the glory of the Lord rises to shine on you. It's not just another light. It's the brilliant light of the Shekinah glory of God. All nations will come to your light. Now, Jeff and Marilyn, it's easy for us, and I'll just say this point blank, uh, because we, you know, I know you know this, we Western Christians are really good at, well, we'll just write a check to Jeff and Marilyn, and, and they'll do the work for us. Here's the problem. When Jeff and Marilyn go to the mission field, what we're saying, if, if we just say, well, we're doing our part, we're writing a check to Jeff and Marilyn, is that then what about this neighborhood? Jeff and Marilyn aren't here right now. Who's going to take care of, who's going to shine the light of God's glory in this neighborhood, in this town, in this city? Right? The mission field starts in our own backyard. Sometimes not even in our own backyard. It starts in our own home. Right? Vast caravans of camels will converge on you on the light of God's glory. Mark Mulder, I, I thought of you this week. It didn't say whether they were Dodge caravans, but... <laughs> you like that one, Mark? Yeah, yeah. The people of Sheba will bring gold and frankincense, will come worshiping the Lord. There, we're we're going to have one of two responses. There's really not much in between. When Jesus returns, we will either be terrified or extremely happy. Not happy because we're perfect, but happy because we know and we will be in the midst of worshiping a God, seeing the glory that we've been waiting to see in all its fullness. Amen. The baptizer John, his father Zechariah, prophesied in Luke 1, even before the birth of Jesus. This is what he prophesied at the end of Luke 1, verses 78 and 79. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light, or otherwise translated, the rising sun from heaven, is about to break upon us and visit us, to give light to those who sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide us to the path of peace. The morning light, God's rising sun from heaven, has visited us and is with us every moment of every day by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ. He is the long-awaited Son of God bringing light into the darkness of our lives. And in order for the world to witness the light that shines upon us and guides our feet in the path of peace for this day for all the world to see. The Lord has come with His bright shining candle. The Lord will return and the Lord will come again with His candle. So we say, Lord, come with Your candle. Amen. Let's pray. My prayer this morning is from the message. It's a rendering of Luke 1. Lord God, through Your heartfelt mercies, Your sunrise breaks upon us shining on us, surrounded by darkness, those of us sitting in the shadow of death's darkness, your light is showing us the way, one foot at a time, down the path of peace. May it be so. So be it. Amen. At this time, we're going to have our offering.